Now, dear viewer, how nice to be back with you. You know, in the midst of my many travels, I managed to do a few recordings, but it always kind of measures me or cuts me to size when I see how many people in desperate need are not really being lifted out of the horrible pit, as the Bible calls it. As one who appeared to be marked for living a doleful existence in the horrible pit. What Jesus has done in me appears to be a miracle to me. Of course, it is the greatest miracle, the change or the transformation in the heart of man. You know, friends, you may wonder, how is it possible? Is it some way of reformation? Is it some new re-education which provides for some kind of uh, newness or a new way of life? Or is it just a change of diet? Or what is it? Well, let me tell you, friends, it's not some kind of meditation or some form of self-improvement or even pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. Quite a lot of people put a great deal of weight upon such procedures today. And if you ask them in a moment of lucidity and truth, hey, tell me, has it produced a true newness within? Or is it some repetition of some chant which you have to keep doing and doing in order to maintain some momentum or some position from which you are at any moment likely to slide away. Oh, my dear friends, none of that kind of fear assailed me. But you will wonder, and it is only reasonable and cogent for us to ask, how is such a miracle possible? From being negative, you become positive. By instead of seeing lions all along the way or in the street and somebody's threatening you here or there is danger lurking there or you're sure to have a fight there this evening with your wife when you come home all stricken with the blues. Well, my dear friend, let me tell you, instead of that, there is a wonderful assurance. And how is that possible? You know, if you indicate 
change of mood or change of kindness into rudeness in your speech, who are the first to discern this? Your children. And you're all the time trying to impress your children with the idea that you are the best father or mother or some such thing. But they notice you with your hair down and your tem tempers all adrift or aflame with the result that they have lost all faith in your great profession of faith. Now that's a terrible thing to happen to anybody. You know, the first to notice it should be your spouse or your maidservant, if you have one, or your children. I would think even the domestic animals would notice the change of heart in you. Now, my dear friends, how is this possible? Let's come to the crux of the matter. It is possible simply because Jesus took your sin and suffered upon the cross and in bearing your sin, he did not just bear a fraction of it. He bore it all. He that never knew sin, never did sin, and in whom was no sin. You know, the Bible declares he became sin. Just think of that. Now, all of us like to wear a shirt with no blots or any dark smudges right in front, you see, and, and everybody can notice, oh, something is wrong with this man. He used to be spotlessly dressed, and here we see him with all this dirt on his shirt front, something is wrong with him. He may be, he's going off his mind or some such thing. Well, somebody who is habituated, somebody who is totally clean, somebody in whom there's no sin, and when he took my sin, that is, when the Lord Jesus Christ bore your sin and my sin upon his sinless body, he became so vile in God's sight until God's word declares that he became sin for us. But you know, the ending of that scripture says, that we should be made the righteousness of God in him. Mark you, can you think of that? Does it not blow your mind? The righteousness of God. You know, we find it tough to live right these days. The boss says, hey, Tell the client, I'm not here. I'm not here. And you lift the receiver or and say, the boss says he is not here. Would you dare say that? No. But the moment you refuse to speak a lie, a boss says, I fear you're no good at all. You're not a help to our organization. 
Now I would like you to resign your position. You know, I've seen many people who told me of tough situations where when they lived straight, their very jobs were in jeopardy. You know, we have so many crooks parading as great business magnates. People who cheat in their books, people who defraud the government, and people who cheat. Oh, when I first heard this phrase from a young man in the United States, cheating on one's wife. I said, what? I never heard of that kind of expression. Well, that's one of the ways by which adultery is currently described. The Bible calls it adultery. Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You know, your body language, your exposure, you know, the minimal clothing that some people like to wear, parading some of those parts of your anatomy which only should be exposed or legitimately used in your bedroom. And to think that you want to make an exposure of it on the street and people would want you to sing one of those popular ballads or songs which just become the rage of the nation. Do it in the street. My beloved people, when we have lost all moral consciousness and integrity, well, in the face of it, in the midst of such a bleak condition, what does God say? God says, My beloved son took all your sin and became a sin before me that you may be the righteousness of God in him. What do you mean? Right living flows from you. Lies have gone. Deceit is a thing of the past. Your books are clean. Your hands are clean. And how does this miracle happen? Have you ever sung that hymn, At the cross, at the cross, Where I first saw the light, And the burden of my sin rolled away? It was there, by faith, I received my sight, and now I am happy all the way, all the day, and all the way. Yes, there is an undercurrent of peace. There is an undercurrent of the consciousness of God wherever you are. You know, some people will look around and say, this must be some wonderful yoga. My dear friend, let me tell you, I have seen men 
who said, I practiced yoga till I could levitate. And I chanted the names of uh, my gods. Millions of times. All to no purpose. When it came to temptation and moral rectitude, I was a flop and failure. I collapsed like nine pits. You know, folks, when you are propounding your theories and minting your money and religion has become purely commercialized, what have you? People can play all kinds of tricks upon unsuspecting, gullible folk. How sad that you, you can have a whole nation or people talking about this latest technique and or this latest guru or this latest uh, practitioner or the propounder of this new system. And it's become a craze for us to run to those particular seminars or stuff to say, I want to lap it up. I need it. My nerves are all frayed. And my family is in shambles. And my whole life is endangered. Well, let me tell you, it is as simple as this. Go to Jesus. My dear friends, look, I address men of many religions and no religion. And those that hate religion, well, of course, when some people call it the opium of the people, oh, I say, indeed, you're dead right. I say, religion has been used to perpetuate oppression. And I want to tell you, my dear friend, I have no quarter whatever for such religious deception. And when greed is mixed with deception of that nature, and you see whole peoples deceived, and the oppression continued. My, I say, what am I doing? What is all this talk about the gospel and all this great preaching and all our media means? Our television and radio. What is wanted? You know, we have sidestepped the cross. We have produced a crossless Christianity. You take Jesus out and you put do-goodism or some fine theological concept by which you say, hey, we all need to have a new reformation and this, that, and the other. Let me tell you, there can be no change in society until the Savior is lifted up. And I, when I am lifted up, will draw 
all men to myself. What? Are we here to lift ourselves up, our puny selves? What is there in me which deserves to be lifted up? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. But when I see Jesus, his sinlessness, his peerlessness, his love, which is beyond compare, and the peace that he brings into the drug-ridden soul, into the alcoholic's heart, who is thoroughly ashamed of himself. As one alcoholic said to me, I am ashamed of myself. Every bone in my body is broken. That's how he described himself. Mark you, here in the British Isles. And when I pick myself up out of the gutter or some such place in the morning, oh, I am ashamed of myself. But let me tell you, my dear friend, indeed we deserve to say, it's only just that we say, I am ashamed of my record, my track record, I am ashamed of my double life. I am ashamed of my sins. But who will deliver me? What is he or who is he that will save me from this heart of unbelief? You know who said that? John Wesley wrote in his diary. When he was returning after his missionary trip to America where he had tried earnestly to do good and apply some of his godly principles but it just didn't work in the colonies and when he was returning he said, who is he or what is he that will save me from this heart of unbelief? And when he repented and turned to Jesus, can you imagine? People would listen to him standing in the sleet, the rain, the snow, Some of the most unruly of men, rioters, mobsters, all sorts. And when they saw and heard this demure, ordinary parson, Declare the word of God. My, it went straight as an arrow into their hearts. And all the great reforms that came to in British history, of course, we are backtracking now, aren't we? We are going against the very word of God to our grave peril and ruin. But let me tell you, my dear friends, those great reforms which brought greatness to this nation. Look at any map of the world. How tiny are the British Isles? And to think that the vast continent or the subcontinent of India was ruled by Britain. Well, of course, there are those who will say, well, those were the days of the colonists where exploitation was the rule and so on and so forth. 
But let me tell you some of the beneficent facts of the rule of law which was brought to India. And the fair-mindedness of the administrators. It is not to be found today. And I know it. The poor man hasn't got a chance. Now, folks, from where does all this reform in society? Where did it all arise and stem from? Prison reform. The abolition of slavery and a lot of other reforms. How did they come about? The social conscience of Britain was awakened. Men discovered that in the cross of Jesus, by returning to Jesus, by repentance, there would come right living. Now, alas, when a Home Secretary comes out with such a statement as, I wouldn't dare or think of going out to buy a fish and chips at 10 o'clock in the evening. You know, folks, I have walked the streets of London after the bus services shut down, alone, no one ever touched me. People did warn me, your attache case or briefcase will be snatched and this, that and the other. It's hard for me to imagine that Britain is, has become so different. A crossless Christianity. You know, I know a little bit of suffering. But I was under an anesthesia when my heart was open three times. I did not know, of course. But when Jesus hung upon the cross, it was real suffering. He suffered for you and me. He took the penalty of your sin and the shame. He was spat upon. My dear friends, in all right reasoning, would you think he deserves to be spat upon? Do you find anyone else that can hold a candle to Jesus Christ? Amongst all this array of great people or supposed mythological gods and all who claim to be prophets and so on, is there one that can hold a candle to the Lord Jesus? His sinlessness, his purity, his love, his death upon the cross, saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. No wonder St. Paul says, God forbid that I should glory in anything but the cross of Christ. There is hardly anything, my dear friends, that you should glory in, save the cross of Christ. Christ died for me. Christ has transformed me. Christ took my sins upon his sinless body. Christ took my wretched condition upon that cruel cross. It was he 
who died in my place, who redeemed me. Are we not to show to this dying world around us, this world of gloom, this world bathed in economic woes today, foreclosures, people that are homeless, jobless, the suffering, sicknesses that defy diagnosis. In the midst of it all, don't we need the living Savior, the Lord Jesus? Dare you be ashamed of him? Dare I be ashamed of him? Who is the one and only hope? before all mankind today or always. Let us go to him. Would you please bow your head while we pray? Let us pray. Father, when we look at the cross, the love of the Savior, his sinless body battered, bruised, bleeding for me. What love is this, that you took my wretchedness upon that sinless body and gave to me this new life with confidence in my tread, with peace in my heart, with balance and right thinking in my mind. What is this great miracle that you work in sinners like me? We humble ourselves, touch every listener, and bless them with your great salvation. Freedom from a lying tongue, from a wicked heart, and from adulterous eyes. Cleansing and healing through the stripes of Jesus. Granted, now, in Jesus' name. Amen.